So we're going to take a look now how that we can use the direct stiffness method for the analysis of frames. So first of all, what we're going to do is inspect just what one frame or beam element looks like. And then we're going to consider how we use the direct stiffness to assemble a number of frame elements together. So first of all, we need the stiffness for a single frame or beam element. So let's just draw the situation we're considering. We have a beam or a frame element. And the beam has nodes at either end. The beam has a length of L and either end of the beam we can say that the beam can either move in the transverse direction so if we're considering the axis of the beam to be X the displacement of the beam can only happen in the Y direction we're not concerned with deformation of the beam along the axis but also so we're going to call this U1 um, we could have the same at the right hand end. We'll call that U2 for node 2. And because this is a beam, we can all also have rotations. So I'm going to call that theta 1. And we can also have a rotation at node 2 of theta 2. And also we can draw the free body diagram for this beam. So we redraw the beam, that was with the displacement. So we're going to draw the beam now. In fact, what we're going to do is draw the beam without the nodes. We're just going to consider the equilibrium of the beam on its own, completely in isolation from other beam elements or the nodes themselves at the ends of the beam. And we can draw a free body diagram with the forces that this beam could be subjected to. So it could be subjected to a shear force S1 at the left hand side and a shear force S2 at the right hand side. We've drawn these positive in the upwards and Y direction. Also, because we can have rotations of the beam, we could imagine that the left hand end could experience a moment M1. And again, we're going anti-clockwise positive on the beam. And the right-hand side of the beam could experience an external moment M2 upon it. And what we wish to do is derive how the different external forces are related to one another. So what we're going to do is recall from earlier studies the slope deflection equations and we can relate the moments at the ends of the beam m1 in terms of the rotations at the ends of the beam theta 1 and theta 2 and also the relative deflections of the beam what we call the chord rotation in the slope deflection equations and that chord re rotation was the delta so delta 1 or u1 minus u2 divided by the length of the beam and we can write that for both m1 and m2 at the left hand end at the right hand end also having a look at our free body diagram so that's our free body diagram just on inspection if we look in the y direction consider the forces in the y direction we can say so from vertical equilibrium we can say that s2 is equal to minus s1 okay now the next thing i'm do is so that I can work out what the shear S1 might look like is I'm going to take equilibrium, moment equilibrium now around this right hand side of the beam. So let's write down the moment equilibrium about the right hand side. So moment equilibrium 
that's just one L and about the right hand side and so we have S1 multiplied by the lever arm L is equal to the moments M1 and M2 and rearrange that slightly S1 equals M1 plus M2 all divided by the length L. So what we're going to do now is substitute that is substitute our values for M1 and M2 that we know from the slope deflection equations. We're going to substitute that into this formula for S1. So I'm going to go with black pen, a bit easier to read. So substitute slope deflection equations. To the above formula and been tidying up and we get that s1 equals to e i divided by l cubed into 12 u1 minus 12 u2 plus e i over L squared into 6 theta 1 plus 6 theta 2. So now we have an equation where we can get the shear at the left hand side in terms of the displacements and the rotations of the end of the beam. The next part of the derivation we're going to go through is if we have the original frame element, we have nodes at the end of the beam. And so what we're going to do is draw the free body diagram for these nodes at the end of the beam. So for node 1, so the free body diagram for node 1, and we'll draw the forces in red. Node 1 could be subjected to an external force F1. It could also be subjected to an external moment. I'm doing this anti-clockwise positive. And I'm going to call this one T1 so we don't get confused with the moment that's from the beam. And now this something that can be slightly confusing. So I'm going to draw... We've got a portion of the beam, and at the left-hand side, we remember our free body diagram for the beam. We have an S1 and an M1 at the left-hand side of the beam. And I'm just going to draw them here. We could have an S1, a shear force, and we could have had a moment, M1, acting on the beam because they're acting on the beam from every reaction as a positive equal reaction we we can have the equal but opposite m1 must act upon the node and likewise the equal and opposite shear force s1 must act on the node so that the the node and the beam ends are in equilibrium so I'm just going to move that out of the way, not to confuse. So this is the full free body diagram now of just a node on its own. And we could draw exactly the same, just for completeness, let's draw it. Let's do this, so that was for node 1. Let's do exactly the same now for node 2. And let's draw the forces on there. So we could have an external force F2 on there we could experience an external moment T2 and from the beam the node is kept in equilibrium from a moment M2 coming from the end of the beam equal and opposite to the moment that is acting on the beam itself 
and a shear force S2 again, equal and opposite from the shear force S2 on the beam itself in isolation. So, from these free body diagrams of the nodes themselves in isolation, we can see examining the forces in the y direction, we can see that F1 must be equal to S1. And we can also see that T1 is equal to the moment M1. And likewise for the node at the other end of the beam, we can see that F2 must be equal to S2 and T2 is equal to M2. So from there, we can have a look. We've already calculated what S1 must be. So therefore, we can write down what our force F1 is in terms of the displacements and rotations at the end of the beam. So we know that F1 is equal to S1. And I'm going to write that equation in terms of the displacements and rotations now in a matrix style format. So we know that that must be equal to EI, and I'm going to use square brackets. So 12 over L cubed, 6 over L squared, minus 12 over L cubed, and 6 over L squared, and that will multiply by a column vector of displacements, let's call that u1, theta1, u2, theta2. And we can do that for the other forces F2, we can do it for the moments as well. We're not going to show the full derivation, but if you carry out the operations required, what we can do is get a set of equations with a vector of our forces, F1, T1, F2, and T2, of the forces acting on upon our nodes, is equal to EI, and we get a big matrix now of coefficients, and we'll write those down in a second, but all in terms of the displacements and the rotations of the nodes. So we've got U1, theta1, U2, theta2, and we're just going to write coefficients here. And we'll fill those out in a moment. And so, again, similar to what we did in one dimension, these material properties EI are multiplied by the coefficient matrix are what we're going to call the stiffness matrix for a beam element. That's just in one dimension. And so for completeness, I've cut and pasted in the coefficients, the 12 over L cubed, 6 over L squared, that would go inside the stiffness matrix. Um, just so you don't get confused, I'm using delta here for, for it's in the nodes instead of U's, but it's the same transverse displacement at node 1.